In addition, the spirit of collaboration and teamwork has been infused in a traditionally rigid bureaucratic structure. In addition, we have encouraged collaboration between public and private sector. But written, all of this has been the statistical basis for evidence-based decision making. We inherited a lot of problems with the Central Statistical Office in 2010 and problems continue, but the CSO has played a vital role in policy making. A human development atlas was completed in 2012 which identified human development challenges in the regions of Trinidad and Tobago. This made it possible to identify gaps the national census was completed in early 2012. This made it possible to work with contemporary data. The CSO has also serviced the country by provision of GDP statistics every year for decades. Trade statistics were a problem after issues emerged with the insta installation of the Asicuda system in customs, but trade statistics are now current. In 2011, labor statistics were four quarters or one year behind. CSO has now caught up but is still two quarters behind. The normal lag is one quarter, and the CSO will be on par with other similar agencies worldwide with up-to-date statistics by June of this year. The inflation data has been provided on time every month for the last 18 months, and we receive help to do this from the IMF. We also have now completed a population policy, an innovation policy, and we are working on a manpower policy to support our 10-year plan of diversification and economic growth and development. Going forward, we will strengthen and continue to develop the five priorities, but we will also focus on intensifying the diversification process, infrastructure development, including expanding of the road network and building a post-Panamax port on one of the existing sites, <clears throat> but also rolling out broadband and, of course, the internationalization of Trinidad and Tobago's energy platform, focused on downstreaming natural gas, exporting knowledge, experience, and services, and on renewable energy and energy efficiency solutions. <clears throat> As we go forward, we will build our policy on about five principles. Principle of sustainable development, the national spatial strategy, which takes us to 2033, close alignment with the post-2015 global development agenda and sustainable development goals, Pursue of, pursuit of a high per capita income and sustained economic growth strategy, and socioeconomic inclusion, including the management of the equity spread. There is a part of this that I want to conclude with, um, and therefore I will skip over the other things. I want to say that the, we are entering a very difficult world now. This is not just a world in which disruptive thinking is required, but where instead there are disruptive changes taking place. And the meaning of these things have yet to be fully absorbed. And so perhaps our thinking on what is taking place around us is not so clear. The world as we know it is under challenge. What are some of these disruptive changes transforming the world we live in? The first thing is the challenge of managing the global financial system, which is not as stable as people assume. The second is the transformation of the global production system, with the shifts towards Asia and emerging countries, and its implications for trade from Asia across to the Panama Canal. The restructuring of the energy matrix and market in which the power of the control of the energy is shifting. Fourth, the opportunity that most growth will take place in emerging and developing countries over the next decade. And five, the authoritarian, militaristic, terrorist interventionists that disrupts peace and order and identify themselves as states. Over the next decade, the issues of how to manage, regulate, and monitor the global financial system, which was severely tested in 2008 and 2009, and which some believe to be fundamentally unsound, will present a formidable challenge as the global economy continues to transform and restructuring of the production system intensify. 
The Schumpterian changes now taking place in the global energy economy will have serious implications for competitiveness, trade, and investment. Moreover, future growth in the world is, pre predicated to, is predicted to occur overwhelmingly in emerging and developing countries. Least developed countries will therefore have an opportunity to triumph over, middle, uh, over the middle, uh, will, least developed countries will have an opportunity to, to move up. Other countries will be able to triumph over the middle income country trap and achieve stronger success. The highly industrialized countries will be able to partner with countries of the South to be able to achieve mutual gains. A glorious future awaits the countries of the Caribbean, consisting of middle income and high human development countries in a transforming world economy. Moreover, the thrust for sustainable development is also likely to leave, yield positive dividends for countries within the region, as well as progressive partnerships between some Commonwealth countries and other global players. With this transformation and restructuring at the economic level, geopolitical shifts will also present new opportunities. The countries of CARICOM are likely beneficiaries of a changing world order that has already been set in motion. In the coming decade, CARICOM will have a rare opportunity to shape its partnerships and institutions, such as the Commonwealth and the UN, and to play a more meaningful role in the world's decisions making. But it has to be prepared. What will be required will be not so much disruptive thinking, but strategic thinking and critical and creative thinking. The disruptions already set in motion by forces in the world will demand. How to take advantage of opportunities presented by these disruptions? How to protect oneself from the vulnerabilities that these disruptions may bring? The time for action alone is long gone. That's to say action on one's own as a country. This is the age of collaboration, partnerships, and multiple alliances to achieve progress. I could not close without proposing action solutions for the region to pursue. And this would, these, in fact, would be bold actions, if not necessarily disruptive, but they will cause change. Resolution of air and sea transport and security challenges in the Caribbean region. The Caribbean is an area of vulnerability on all three counts. An action agenda for integration of the production system of the region for development integration within a sustainable development framework. Three, transformation of the energy matrix in the region to make the region competitive. The cost of energy is driving the region out of any engagement economically with the rest of the world, at least for the countries outside of Trinidad and Tobago. A broadband and internet-based knowledge access and knowledge, creativity, and innovation strategy for the region linked to productivity, entrepreneurship, and applications for innovation. Five, facilitate private sector growth and investment and public-private sector partnership and a less engaged role for the state in the economy. Six, set objectives and targets for the five above and stick to it. Seven, work with global and regional financial institutions to actual, actualize plans and achieve results because everything has to be financed. But we cannot do everything. If we did those seven things and we did them well and we managed them and leadership was given to each one and collectively we could get somewhere. Because the world is changing whether we change or not. And change is required of us to meet the changes that are occurring around us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Tiwari. I'd like to now ask Ms. Amina Mohammed, who is the Special Advisor to the UN Secretary General, to uh, share some thoughts and remarks with us this morning. Mindful of your red card. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, Honorable Minister Dukran, Excellencies, friends, especially Andy Knight, where are you? He's uh, been uh, putting the needle under me to get here. 
uh, but also colleagues, uh, Richard, thank you, the team that's here as well. And I'd like to give a really special shout out because as I came through this conference this morning, I have never seen so many women and young people. So thank you for making it about the future that starts today. Uh, friends, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, when I was first asked to do this job of helping to shape the new development agenda, one of the things that I really wanted to do when the Secretary General said to me, you know, this is a universal agenda, was really to feel and live and be real and true to what universality meant. And from the first report that we had for the Secretary General, it was all, all about leaving no one behind. Uh, and that means especially uh, those that are the smallest members of our family and often in previous development agendas overlooked. So being part of the SIDS discussion over the last three years and your interaction, I think has improved the quality and the ambition of what we've got when we say leaving no one behind. Um, I've got uh, lots to, to remind me that in this short time that I've got to share a few remarks with you. The most important thing is to try not to perhaps say the same things in the same way or um, speak the UNEs that everyone accuses us of, um, but also be reminded that perhaps the greatest um, contribution I've made, at least to myself and uh, to my community, are my six children. And they constantly remind me that when I'm standing on the podium to remember when I was in the audience um, and try to relate that way. The post-2015 agenda, the sustainable development framework that we're all speaking about, was actually born in Rio. And it was born in 1992. And um, you know, a great uh, lady, Gro Gruntland, um, was behind that, and we spent the last few days with her. I've sort of traveled in the last few days from Jakarta to Brazil to Seattle and now down in Trinidad. That's universal for us. But it was, I think, coming of age in 2012 when member states of the United Nations said, well, enough about the talk. Let's actually see if we can walk this transition of the Millennium Development Goals into Sustainable Development Goals using the sustainable framework. So this agenda is building on what we've done. And as Richard said, the glass might be half full, half empty. What we've got to do is take the full and run with it and see if we can't fill it up, fill it up that it is more relevant to what the global challenges that we have today. And I'm just going to cut and paste what Minister Torreit said on the global context, because it is the backdrop that we need to respond to. It's a very complex one. Things that happened in 2000 are very different from where they are today in 2015. So we have to take notice of it. We have to know that in this global village, what happens in my country in northern Nigeria um, also affects what happens in Europe and what happens in the Caribbean. It's therefore incredibly important that we do learn from the lessons of the MDGs and that we do take context into consideration and that whatever framework that we have globally, that it is our responsibility to domesticate it. Not to take it as a prescription that we all have accused the MDGs of, but to bring it down and to really think it through. We are in charge of our destinies in our own countries, in our families, in our communities. And we take this to lift it, to lift the ambition, to bring, bring us closer together as part of a, a global village. So it is important that this time round, that we look much, much more to the root causes of what hasn't worked and to stop addressing the symptoms, the band-aid that we've been putting for the short, short term on, on everything, which we always give um, the excuses of timelines that we have, and they could be ones of uh, cycles in, in the political uh, democratic cycles that we have. It could be uh, ones that we talk about when we